Now, once again, going through Micah chapters 3 through 5, we're going to make our way through all three chapters today, so some of it will go fairly quickly. Just follow along in your Bibles as I'm making our way through the text here. Now, if you were here for the previous sermon on Micah, that is chapters 1 and 2, Micah is a prophet. He's come to pronounce a judgment upon Israel for their rebellion to the Lord. Now, they are to be a holy and a righteous people, but godly people are nowhere to be found. As a result of their wickedness, God God promises they will now experience hardship. They will now experience evil from the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, which for them, that simply means that the destruction of everything they hold dear is going to happen. Now, in the midst of this, though, in the midst of this pronouncement of judgment comes an incredible pronouncement of hope. The Lord will send his Messiah as the true and the righteous judge who will redeem his people He will remove idolatry and corruption from their midst, and he will defeat all of Israel's enemies. In other words, God's punishment upon them is not the final word. He will restore them to an even greater stature than before under the lordship of the coming Messiah. Now, as we look at chapter 3, we are going to start right in verse 1 here. I want you to notice that the first group of people Micah focuses upon are these rulers in Israel. Now, these are the people that God is charged with upholding the law that was given to Moses at Sinai. They're the ones commanded to maintain equity and justice among the people. They have a responsibility to know the word of the Lord and the law of God in and out so they can lead God's people in righteousness, and yet they have perverted justice. We see at the end of the verse here, Micah asks them this rhetorical question. He asks, is it not for you to know justice? And you can almost hear the taunt of the prophet here, can't you? Are you not the ones that are placed in authority by God himself? Do you not know what the book of the law requires of you? Do you not know that the Lord your God is a just God, a holy God, requiring that you act with justice, that you love mercy, and that you walk humbly with your God? Now, if you remember from the first chapter of Micah, We saw that Yahweh is pictured as his judge that's coming out of his chambers. He's pronounced a conviction against them, and the conviction rendered is absolutely devastating. Now, they stand before this judge with no defense. And the reason for this is simply that they have violated every known law that they could. And the judge's response to them, again, is it not your job to know justice? Now, see in verses 2 and 3, he continues to pile these descriptions upon them. He says of them, You who hate evil and love, or you who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, who strip off their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them up as for the pot and as meat in a kettle. Now, everything flows from the fact that these rulers hate all that is good. It's not that they've made some poor decisions. It's not that they've let the occasional temptation rule over them. Rather, they are defined by their love of evil. Now, the imagery Micah uses here is absolutely grotesque, is it not? Now, their cruelty toward their brother is so severe, their evil is so extensive that what they are doing can only be described as this worst form of torture imaginable. The rulers, they were to be these people who maintained justice. And yet they rigged the system so they could satisfy their thirst for wealth and luxury off of the desecrated corpses of their brothers and sisters. Now if you look at verse 4, he continues on here. Micah pronounces what their judgment is going to be as a result of their wickedness. They will cry out for mercy, they will cry out for relief, and yet God will not give it. They presumed upon the Lord's patience. They believed even in that day, when he finally made good to judge them for their wickedness, that they might still be able to cry out for help, they might be able to cry out for deliverance, and that he would actually respond to them. And yet, what will they hear but a deafening silence? Now, I can't help but think of these men as a proverbial fool we find in Proverbs chapter 1. They reject the cry of Lady Wisdom. Wisdom sounds the alarm of repentance in the gates. She stretches forth her hand for the fool to just simply grab a hold and live. Yet the fool refuses to listen. They ignore her, thinking that tomorrow is guaranteed of them. And yet, 
If you remember, on that day when their life is required of them, they will cry out to Lady Wisdom to no avail. They will thrust out their help for, or hand for help only to watch their life flee before them like a slow trickle of water from their cupped hands. Yet lest we think that the only fools Micah has in mind here are these rulers, uh, turn your attention now to verses 5 through 7. We see he looks to the prophets, the preachers of the day, if you will. We find out in verse 5 they are using their position to line their pockets with the money of the corrupt rulers. They go from region to region to pronounce one of two things upon these men, and that's either blessing or a cursing. And of course, we see that their pronouncements are tied exactly to what they can get out of it through extortion. They give a pronouncement of blessing and peace to the one who keeps them fed, and yet to the one who gives them nothing, they prophesy of a war sent from God. So in one sense, you have these wicked rulers they're biting and devouring their own people. Also, they can live a life of affluence and ease. And then the prophets are standing behind these wicked rulers, muttering threats of war sent by God if they don't get a cut. At the same time, these rulers are so hardened in their hearts against God himself that they have their own personal team of prophets on the bankroll. So if the message of doom comes from one of these prophets, you just slip old Zed a handful of shekels, and suddenly he calms down a little bit. What's more than this is he promises you that with a seed of faith you just sowed, you've just bought yourself some peace of God. And they have this whole scheme set up together. The rulers rip off their own people and their own countrymen, and then the prophets rip off the rulers, and neither one of them call one another out for their sins. It's not even hard to imagine that they may have tried to buy off Micah. So as a result of their wickedness, we see now in verses 6 and 7, he just simply tells them that God is going to judge them equally as harshly as the rulers. Now verse 6 speaks of this idea that they're going to turn to the Lord and with an earnest desire to hear from him. They actually want to hear from God, and yet they too will experience a deafening silence. Now, the darkness brought upon them here speaks to this idea that these men were once able to actually prophesy. They were once able to have visions. They were able to actually do the work the Lord gave them, and yet now they will have nothing as a result of their wickedness. And so one of the things that I find interesting, at least in the Bible, is that you have a mention made of false prophets over and again throughout the Scriptures, and yet the Bible never assumes that they could not prophesy and could not see visions. Instead, the Bible focuses on their message and their own devotion and loyalty to Yahweh. The thing to keep in mind here with these guys is that Micah is condemning a people that should know better. They ought to know the word of God when they hear it. They're prophets, right? And yet, they reject it. Now, they reject it because they've been making a practice of ignoring the law of God and ignoring the word of God. And truthfully, that's because they have not seen God punish them yet for it. And this is a span of over a hundred years. They have not seen God punish these people for their wickedness. It's not simply that they have gotten away with it, but their fathers and their fathers' fathers have gotten away with it. And so Micah preaches judgment. Lady Wisdom cries out in the gates with him. They both plead for their repentance and to turn back to Yahweh, and yet they will not listen. On the day of their calamity, though, they will cry out, and God will not respond. Now, verse 7 lays this reality out all the more clearly. If you would look down, we see these false prophets will be seen precisely for who they are. There will be no mistaking their corruption nor their evil. They cried for peace as they lined their pockets with other people's money. And yet the Lord will raise the Babylonians and the Assyrians against them to wipe them out, and everyone will see their lies and shame. Now, one of the things that might slip by here in verse 7 is that the second half of it actually plays off of the first half of verse 4 with the rulers. The rulers are going to come to the prophets, are going to inquire of the Lord together, and neither will receive an answer. And whatever honor that the prophets had in their role as prophets of Yahweh is stripped away from them because they will not have a word from God to deliver to the people. They will finally seek him when the judgment comes and all they will return, or hear in return, is a deafening silence. Now this is perhaps the most terrifying sign of judgment 
Because God hears his people, and yet he will not hear them. Now Micah, of course, stands in sharp contrast to these men in verse 8. It says that he, on the other hand, is filled with the power of the Spirit, that he's the one that truly comes with the word of the Lord. He is filled with justice and with courage, and this is a direct knock against these rulers and prophets and their corruption. We already know that the rulers are in charge of executing justice without partiality, and yet they're perverting justice. We know the prophets are to call people to obedience and faithfulness, and yet they will not do it. Yet Micah is the complete opposite of this. Now Micah is a guy that by the power of the Spirit, he brings the word to bear on the people without qualms. He's a guy who preaches with a boldness and a conviction. In other words, Micah is a guy that comes to the table with this intellectual, this physical and spiritual strength to just stand in the midst of a perverted generation and speak the truth, whatever the consequences. He speaks truth and lets the chips fall where they may. He is, in essence, what the Bible would call a godly man. He's a godly man, gripped with conviction, gripped in the conviction of the truth, gripped in the conviction of the Spirit of God and the power of the Spirit of God. And then we see that in this conviction, in this empowerment, in verses 9 through 12, he just continues to rail against these guys and their wickedness. Notice, look down in verse 9. They are people who hate justice. They twist everything that is straight. Verse 10, they build up a nation on violence and murder. Verse 11, the rulers are bought off with a bribe. The Levites, the priests, perform their priestly service for money, even though they are forbidden to by the law of Moses. The prophets prophesy for sordid gain, and all the while, every one of them are claiming that God is in their midst. In other words, they're committing these vile crimes against their brother and against their sister and against their God. And they are saying, God is blessing everything we do. Now notice as a result in verse 12, he declares God will bring these capital cities down to the ground. And we saw this before. But also the temple, the very dwelling place of the Spirit of God, will be destroyed. And all that simply means is that the Spirit of God will be removed from their midst. God will not be among his people any longer. Now imagine hearing that message as missio. Just imagine that. Imagine hearing that because of your sin and your lack of repentance that God will remove his presence from you. It's a terrifying prospect for these people. And yet it is not the last word that we will see as we move to chapter 4. Now what is marvelous about chapter 4 is that immediately after pronouncing an incredibly harsh judgment, God gives them a promise that he will not abandon them. He promises to restore them. And it's important for us to know that as we move through this chapter, Micah, he's looking both at their current situation, that is their impending doom and exile, but also this far off future point where there will be actual lasting world peace brought on by the Messiah himself. Now what we are speaking of here is a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. I know some of you do not believe that the millennial reign is a literal thing that happens. You know, perhaps you look at it figuratively. You, you look at it as the so-called age of the church, if you will. But what I'm asking you to do is just look at the text with me. Just look at the text with me as I go through it here. The only way you can see this is something other than that literal millennial reign of Christ is if you say that this prophecy was never meant for Micah's audience. It could never give them a true, tangible hope in the midst of their impending exile. Now follow along with me, though. Look at verse 1. Micah, he's using this far-off future point, and he's referring here to the temple being rebuilt. And the people of the earth will flock to it in droves. Now again, he's not talking about the rebuilding of the temple after their exile, because if you know your history, the Romans come and sack it all over again in 70 AD, and it's destroyed. But the reason that is so is because if you look at the rest of this text, there is nothing in the history of Israel or even the church that is anywhere close to what is described here. Nothing. Notice in verse 2, the prophet speaks of these people coming from far off nations, 
for the purpose of sitting at his feet, that is God himself, so they might learn from him. There is this constant stream of people like a river flowing to the temple because from the temple flows the very word of God and the very law of God in complete perfection. Let's see now in verse 3, Christ stands as a judge. He is arbiter between all nations. And so great superpowers of the earth will literally come to him and subject themselves to his decision and to his rule because from his mouth flow supreme truth and equity and justice. This is a direct contrast to what Micah is dealing with here with the prophets and the rulers because they are a great people or a, a people of great sin and great corruption. And yet, he tells of this true ruler, this true prophet, priest, and king that will uphold the standard of God in complete perfection. And he will do it in complete authority and all the nations of the earth will yield themselves to his authority. His justice will be so righteous and so good that as a result, war itself will go away. Their weapons of war are going to be turned into tools of agriculture for farming. Their training for war will be a practice long forgotten and abandoned. And if we're honest, this alone sounds pretty darn good, doesn't it? When was the last time any human in history has not worried about the prospect of war? We're not seeing a group like ISIS behead more Christians. Now notice again in verse 4, Micah shows that each man is going to live in this truly utopian state. They will not only have the right to their inheritance, that is the land given to them by Yahweh, but they will live without fear in that land. They will have no concern of those who come to rob them, those who come to kill them, extort them, or take advantage of them. And, and Why? Because God himself declares this. He has declared this edict and the people will submit to his rule, just as was said in verses 2 and 3. Yet then see in verse 5, Micah takes this and brings him back to their present reality. He says, Though the foreign nations now will follow after their false gods, the Israelites will not. They will walk in the name of Yahweh forever and ever. Yeah, but I want you to see here is how this present reality is sandwiched in between two future realities. The first is in verses 1 through 4, the second in 6 through 8. And the reason for this is, is incredibly simple. Micah is calling his people, the Lord is calling his people to covenant faithfulness in light of these future promises. As they await the day when all nations will subject themselves to the rule of the true judge and the righteous king, they are called to walk in faithfulness to God. Now, the second future reality that we just touched on briefly in, is in 6 through 8, and it speaks of this remnant that is being brought back in and established to an even greater glory than before, even greater than Israel's greatest king, King David. It's important for us to know, though, that these promises of this future glory his promise of renewal and provision and prosperity, everything attached to it is very real for them, and yet it is out of their grasp, is it not? All of these promises come off of the coattails of judgment. And yet what that specifically means, if we are consistent in how we read this passage, is that these promises are actually for them and their children. Now look at the description that he gives these people. They are the lame, they are the outcast, they are the ones afflicted that is punished by God. These are all descriptions describing what is to come as a result of this judgment at hand. And yet, they will be restored. There are people who have no special significance to them other than the fact that God has given them these promises. For us, that shows us they are not being cast away forever, because of their disobedience. They are being a people, or they are a people being punished. Don't get me wrong. Literally, the expression in the Hebrew is that they are a people the Lord is bringing great evil upon. But ask yourself, to what end? It's restoration. They are a weak people. They are a lame people. They are a defiled people. They are ones afflicted and punished by God. And yet there are people the Lord will once again bring into being a strong nation where he will bodily dwell in their midst as a true prophet, 
as the true priest and the true king. Now verses 7 through 8 here speak of their former dominion under King David. Now it's going to be restored to them, but at an even greater capacity. And why? Because the one who is to reign on the Davidic throne forevermore will be in their midst. We've already had a description of what that looks like in verses 1 through 4, so I'm not going to spend much more time on that detail here. But again, notice that when this remnant is brought back together under the rule of God, it is forever. It specifically says that in the text. It is a condition of God's own work and faithfulness to his covenant, not the faithfulness of the Israelites. However, it is also a condition of this time when the Lord himself will reign among them. And he will be the true and the better David. Now what that specifically means is that these promises to them will not come in full until he reigns from Jerusalem. That's incredibly important when we get to the New Testament because that's exactly what many a Jew either ignored, missed, or simply rejected when Christ came. However, if you read this passage in any other way, meaning if you allegorize it or you spiritualize it and you make it about the church rather than the nation of Israel, the rest of this chapter makes no sense. Because in verses 9 through 13, he is encouraging them in light of this future reality. He is giving them a hope in the midst of impending doom. It is in the midst of them losing everything that he turns their sights back to this promised one who will come and sit on David's throne forever and that he will subdue all of Israel's enemies. And we're going to see that in greater detail in chapter 5, but for now I want you to look at verse 9. Again, Micah switches back to their present reality. He asks them, Now why do you cry loudly? Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished that agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Now they would have been intimately familiar with everything Micah told them thus far that there is one who will come who will rule from the throne of David forever and that this one who is to come will restore order to a chaotic world marred by sin, death, and Satan. Yet we must also understand that the kingship of the Israelites means so much more to them than having a king. He was representative of the promised Messiah. If the king remained, the promise remained. Now to lose your king as an Israelite is a direct threat of the covenant God made with David, that his house and his kingdom and his throne will endure forever. The removal of their king is a visible expression that they have exhausted the very grace of God and his wrath is upon them. And yet if you followed along with me, what has Micah done but encourage them all along that the promise of this great king remains? However, notice though, Micah still commands them in verse 10, writhe in labor, be in agony. And if you're a mom here, you know exactly the type of pain he's talking about. The whole body contorts under the contractions. They continue to rise in severity and in length. You can't control any bit of it. Once the process starts, you have to complete it. There's no going back. The baby must come out. And really, that's the extent of what he's telling these people here. This process will not stop. Oh, Israel, you will be cast out of the land. You will no longer live in your homes. You will be brought under the oppressive rule of foreigners, and you will lose your king. And yet, just as there is a blessing of a beautiful child attached to the intense pain of labor, there is this promise of the true and better David attached to the intense pain of their exile. And then look at verse 10. Micah says it is from from there, from Babylon, where they're going to be exiled, that Yahweh himself will rescue and redeem them. He's not simply going to remove them from Babylon, from harm's way. The Lord himself, the way it's describing it here, and he's going to act as their kinsman redeemer. He's going to buy back Israel. He's going to clear her debt. He will take her. He'll take them back as his possession, in all of her wickedness, despite all of her prostitution to foreign gods, despite all of her corruption and defilement, and he will clear it from their record and he will restore them as his people. Again, verse 11, Micah now draws his attention back 
to these nations who currently look at Israel and desire to see her come to open shame and defilement. Now, the image this truthfully brings to mind here in the text is that her enemies, they want to see her soiled and defiled like a bride taken on her wedding night and violated. And yet, look at verse 12. Israel's enemies do not know the thoughts and purposes of God. These nations do not see that though Israel has played the harlot, that God is her redeemer and he has promised to avenge his people, that he will be a curse to those who curse Israel. And the explicit purpose for this is given at verse 12, at the end of it at least. Why? Because he has gathered these nations like sheaves to the threshing floor. Now, before machines were used for this process, you would gather your grain into bundles and you would beat them against the threshing floor so the seed would separate from the husk. The image being used here is that God has gathered these nations for judgment. He has gathered and bundled them together. And that just as a seed is separated from the chaff, so too will Israel be separated from her enemies. And the purpose of Israel's judgment, even her judgment, reveals God's faithfulness to deliver on his promise to judge the nations. What that specifically means is that Israel is punished, but not forsaken. They are cast out, but not indefinitely of the covenant he made with them because he's still honoring his promise to curse those who curse Israel. And what's more than this is that in verse 13, we, we see the promise given that he will restore or reverse her fortunes. The language used of the iron horn and the bronze hoofs here in verse 13 speak of a power and endurance that Jerusalem will actually have to conquer her enemies. She will not simply defeat her enemies, it will be a crushing defeat. And from this crushing defeat, Jerusalem will devote the spoils of war to the Lord, to the ends of the earth. The picture here, again, speaks to this idea of God's complete and utter sovereignty over all nations, but especially his bride. Not only will he be the one to redeem his bride and to reverse her fate, but he will inevitably claim what is rightfully his to begin with, which is the total sum of the earth. Now, as we move to chapter 5, I want you to see that Micah is going to follow the same pattern he's used thus far. The threat of judgment from the Assyrians and the Babylonians is still at hand. They're still going away into exile. They're still going to be judged for their wickedness. And yet this promise of restoration and ultimate victory and conquest remains. If you look at verse 1, it's, it's essentially a summary of everything that's been said thus far concerning their judgment. They will rise for battle, yet ultimately the invading king will strike Israel, he'll strike her king, and put him to open shame. Now, the use of the rod here to strike his cheek, it actually depicts the utter hopelessness this man has to deliver his people from the hand of the oppressor and to escape judgment himself. Now, when we actually see this play out is in 2 Kings 25. We see Nebuchadnezzar, he comes in, he slaughters the king's sons, he kills the nobles of Judah, and then he captures Zedekiah, he gouges out the man's eyes, he binds him, and then he brings him to Babylon as a slave. And yet when we get to verse 2, we have the adversative use of the word but here. It's an incredibly strong contrast. We have one who is to come from this insignificant little town of Bethlehem. I mean, it's not even on the record. And this one who is going to be born will be born for the very purpose of setting the captive free. There's an incredibly sharp contrast between this powerless earthly king the one who inevitably will go into bondage with his people, and this messianic king who is to come. Now, if you know, Bethlehem is a home to the birthplace of Israel's greatest king, King David. But now it's promised to be that of one who is even greater than David. Remember that at the same time that Micah is giving his prophecy, Isaiah is giving a prophecy concerning the Messiah. He says, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, that is God with us. And again, that this child born of a virgin will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
And it is said of him that the increase of his government and peace will know no end. He will reign on the throne of David over his kingdom and establish and sustain it with justice and with righteousness from that time forevermore. What do you find but God reminding his people that indeed he will fulfill his promises to King David, that one will sit on his throne forever and reign in perfection? He is reminding his people of this one who is to come, who is the promised seed of Abraham, the one through whom all of the earth will be blessed. He is reminding his people of this great promise of one who will come to crush the head of the serpent, for this promise was from old, from long ago. And even still, from the days of eternity past, God brings forth the reality the promise that is made between the members of the Godhead and their eternal counsel that the Son of God will come to deliver his people from their sins. And what's more is that he will return and set all things right. There will be actual lasting peace. And yet notice in verse 3, God will give them up. That is, they will be afflicted, punished of God until the time of this promised one's birth. They will remain a scattered and dispersed people until Christ comes to deliver them. And only then shall they be a people under his rule. Now the idea here goes back to Micah too. The Lord himself will gather the whole of Israel into the pen. He himself will go before them as their shepherd. And as he goes before them as their shepherd, he will do so with the divine strength and rule and regal authority befitting of his great nature and promises to them. He will lead his people in righteousness and justice and they will know actual peace. And really, here's when we turn to this beautiful portrait of God's restoration of his own people in verse 4. They will remain in him in security. Why? Because the Messiah will go before them as they conquer their enemies. One can't also help but sense that in the midst of this, they will remain in singular devotion to their Lord. And the reason for that is at the end of the chapter, which we will touch on in just a moment. But I want you to see that they will remain in him because he will be great to the end of the earth. This brings us right back to the beginning of chapter 4, does it not? We see that the Lord himself will subdue his enemies and he will bring in an age of unparalleled peace and prosperity. Now Micah takes this then in verses 5 through 9. He takes this idea of their shepherd king going before them and then he applies it to the whole, meaning simply that he's going to take this and make Assyria the representative of any who would come against him and his people as their enemy. I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, but See in verse 5, Micah calls them to look to this Messiah as their peace in the time of invasion. Why? Well, in verse 6, this Messiah, he will deliver them from the hands of their enemies when they attack. Verse 7, he will make a remnant that will be innumerable, that will become a blessing to all nations. Verse 8, he will make this remnant fierce like a lion who tramples and tears through his foes. And then in verse 9, we find another summary statement of this hope that is to come for them. Their hand will be lifted up against their adversaries and all of their enemies will be cut off. So as we take this and look at it, what Micah, what he's telling this people is that when the Messiah's kingdom comes in all its fullness, the people of God will no longer be subjected to an oppressor. They will no longer bear the scorn of the nations and the persecutions of their enemies, but they will do so only because their shepherd king will go before them. He will go before them as their breaker. Now in the final five verses, we then see another great promise given to them. And I truthfully hope that this is an incredible encouragement to you if you are in Christ today. I'm going to again, I'm going to move through this section very quickly because it stands mainly as a marker of what God will destroy among his own people in order to bring them into a purity of worship and affection for him. See, in in, in everything listed through verses 10 through 14, we find the essentials of idolatry here. An idol being simply defined as something you place your trust and your affections in other than Christ. God says he will destroy their horses and their chariots. He will cut off the cities from their land. He will tear down all of their strongholds. He will cut off their sorceries 
They will have no more fortune tellers, that is, those who try to divine the mind of God. He will cut off their carved images, their idols, their sacred pillars, their astroths. For what purpose? So that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. Now, the reason for this is incredibly simple. They trusted in their own might to save themselves, and they loved the creation rather than the creator. However, if you've been paying attention throughout the entire sermon, he's doing this for the very purpose of restoring them as his people. He is going to do this to redeem them, to remove corruption and defilement from among them, and not to condemn them. And yet, verse 15, see what he then does. I will execute vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations which have not obeyed. He moves to pouring out his wrath upon the nations that do not pay homage to him, that do not love him. And here we find two complete opposite ends of the spectrum in God's judgment. On the one hand, we have a God who will judge an unrepentant Christian or believer or his child, but he will not do it to their condemnation. He will do it to restore them. And then on the other hand, you have those who are not in Christ, those who do not believe in the God of the Scriptures, and he will judge them to their condemnation. And what that means is they will go to hell. That's what's told of us right here. The two very different ends of the spectrum in God's judgment. Now the temptation in in all of this, in all three of these chapters we've just listened to, is that we might lose the forest for the trees because of everything that's going on here, because of all these incredibly wonderful promises and all these uh, tellings of what is to come for the child of God. And yet, Micah's message and the whole of the book is to get them to see that they are to be a people who do justice, who love mercy and walk in humility with their God. That is, that they will actually be loyal to God. That's what drives all of our application here today, whether you're a Christian or not. Now, for the one who does not profess Christ here today, I I simply beg you to just look at the example laid before you. Now, you've heard it, that God will not spare from punishing his own child. And yet he does it to their restoration. If you would simply entrust yourself to the saving work of Jesus Christ, you would find not that condemnation rests upon you, but that his grace and his mercy and his love will restore you. That though you may be in the darkest pits of despair in your own soul, and you know your sin, and yet you do not want to let it go, that he will remove it from you. But until you do so, the wrath of God rests upon you, and it will not depart until you throw yourself at his great mercy. Again, you've seen that God promises to punish his own child. Will you, the one who is not his child, escape the wrath that is to come? Is it not better to receive discipline as a child he loves, as a child he wants to restore, than to delay your repentance until the day evil comes upon you and you cry out only to hear nothing in return? Today. Now, for the Christian here who remains in sin, I also I earnestly plead with you to consider the example laid before you. The child of God, again, is not free from receiving an incredibly harsh punishment at times. And if you are being punished by God because you are holding on to your sin and you have exhausted his patience towards you, let it be known, though, it is not a season of hopelessness for you. We get so twisted up that we even see this in all of its negative light rather than for the glory that is had through what God is actually promising his people. Now, we all stand utterly unworthy of the grace we are given. We are all sinners. We are all people consumed with grief and failure. And if we are brutally honest with ourselves, rebellion to the core of our being. If you're like me, and I know you are because I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, even your best deeds, even your best thoughts, even your best intentions are enough to condemn you to hell for all eternity. We have nothing, beloved, to give. 
But do you not know that though this truth cuts so sharply that it divides the spirit from the soul, the joints from marrow, the thoughts from the intentions, that it drives us back to Jesus Christ, our Savior, because he is ultimately the one that though he may discipline us in our time of rebellion, he does not do it to our condemnation. He does not do it to our condemnation, but to our restoration. And do you not know that the pain of conviction from your sin and the discipline of God is a sure sign that you are his child? The one who sins without grief and without sorrow is the one that I worry about more than everybody else. And the reason for that is he has not yet awoken from his slumber and realized that he has deluded himself into thinking he is a Christian. All because he has never once felt the sting of God's corrective rod. Now, the hope in the midst of your punishment is not that you and I would avoid the consequence of sin. It's not. But that through God's grace, you would be restored to a place of loyalty and devotion to God himself. The purpose of God's discipline on you, then, is twofold, if you will. The first being that he is going to use it to purge you of all in your heart that desires sin and a love of this world, and a love of that which is evil in place of him. And again, if we are truly honest with ourselves, we all have some sort of pet sin we cling to, that we coddle, that we stroke affectionately. We'll give up many other sins, we'll give up the easy ones, but not that one. Know that if you are a genuine child of God, you can give it up willingly. Or he's going to rip it from you, painfully. And yet it will be removed nonetheless. Just as God promised to remove Israel's idolatry and corruption, he has promised the same exact thing for the church today through the Spirit of Christ. Yet how much more pleasant is it for you and for me if we would simply obey what we know to be good and to strive after holiness? Now, the second purpose of discipline is that it is not enough, hear me, it is not enough for God to destroy that sin which takes special residence in your heart. It's not enough. You can give up the drunkenness, you can give up the sex, you can give up everything else, you can give up your desire for money, you can give up the lies. It is not enough. The purpose, the second purpose, is that God would fill in you and place in you an ultimate expression of hope and delight in God himself. That he would restore your affections to him. That you would love him. Everything in the book of Micah is driving towards this grand point that God is a righteous and true judge of all the earth and that we are to be a people of justice. We are to be a people who love mercy. We are to be people who walk humbly in submission to our God. We do not place our hope in earthly princes or kings. We do not place our hope in the mechanisms of war. We do not place our hope in the strength of men or even the hearts of men. We don't give our affections to another. We do not walk as the rest of this world walks. If you do not hate your brother, and your mother, and your son, and your daughter, and your wife, and your child, anything that you can possibly think of. Jesus says, you do not love me. You are not worthy to love me. He must take first place. Now, Surely, if you are his child, you know that he is just. You know that he is jealous. You know that he won't allow us to presume on his grace and mercy and his patience. Beloved, this is the beautiful thing. Hear me, this is beautiful. He will purge us of our idols. And at some points, that might be in the most painful of ways, and yet it won't be to your condemnation. Some of you know that well because you have experienced an incredibly painful discipline from God. But others, others, I fear you do not seriously contemplate why your life seems to be one of just constant hardship. Why it seems to be one of constant doubt. Is it possible? Just 
ask yourself, is it possible that God has his hand upon you and punishes you because you have not yet submitted yourself to him? Is it possible that he feels so very far removed because of how great a wall of sin that you have placed between he and you? Is it possible that he sees how desperately wicked your heart is, just as mine, and he knows how desperately you cling to your sin, and yet how fast you flee from the course of correction he gives? But not again to your condemnation, but to your restoration, to restore you to an even greater place than when you first even knew Christ. Now, whether you place your trust and affections, again, in money, in sex, in materialism, in your retirement savings, even your retirement itself, your home, your spouse, your child, whatever it is that causes you to make choices to the detriment of your own spiritual well-being before God and that of the church, my earnest hope for you is that you would treasure Christ above all else. Again, it is not enough that these things be removed from our hearts. It is not enough to put off. We must put on. My hope for you today is that you would place your ultimate hope and affection in Christ. You would put your hope in the fact that he came in the flesh so that we might be saved by grace through faith and that this is the ultimate hope that God gives his people. And yet he doesn't even leave it here. He will come again. He will come again in the midst of his people's rebellion And he has poured out words of comfort and grace that one came as a deliverer, that he would not simply deliver them from the persecution of their enemies in some future point, but from their greatest enemies, sin, death, Satan. Oh, he has given us so great a salvation and promised so great a reward. Shall we be content with lesser things? My hope is that you would order your life under the full rule of Christ. There are so many things vying for your love. The most prominent of which are your own desires. Do you not see that such things, no matter how harmless they may seem, are truly your enemy if they do not bring you to a greater love of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this text here. I know it is an incredibly hard one. I know it is one that pains the conscience, especially the sensitive soul. But I pray that rather than letting us simply sit in despair over our own sin, rather than letting us come to abundant shame, that that shame would motivate us and lead us to repentance and that it would drive us to a deeper love of Jesus Christ. I pray for those here who may not know you this day, that you would settle it upon their heart to know that Jesus Christ is one who came to set the captive free. He is one that has come to free them from whatever sin they are enslaved to. And he's not come simply that he might forgive them, though that is incredibly large and gracious gracious measure of providence, but that he has come to lift them up, to restore them, and to bring them to an even greater hope that in spite of everything else that might fail, that in spite of our bodies who are, that are subjected to weakness and the diseases that could ravage us, that in spite of the lies, in spite of the half-truths, in spite of the sufferings, that ultimately one day you will return and set all things right. We will walk with you forevermore in your presence and that you will wipe away every single tear from our face. May you give them an ever-increasing measure of fear until they learn that perfect love casts out fear. And then may you lift them up and restore them to you that they may love you. For your people here, I pray, moreover, that you would cause them to love you at an even greater level, so that in the midst of affliction, in the midst of their own sin, in the midst of their own words even, the thoughts that condemn us, 
that you lift their spirits and let them know that even though discipline is not pleasant for the moment, it produces in us something glorifying. It produces in us something glorious altogether for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that that would be an incredibly large measure of hope for them to know that though you afflict them, it is not to their condemnation. It is in Jesus' name we pray.